Alpha Omega London, makers of shoes, creator of waves in the fashion industry, introduces the Fashion Vanguards podcast. Our aim is simple, to open minds, listen to opinions, share knowledge and start conversations. Our podcast series unravels fashion's many guises and tackles head on the current issues that matter, getting honest views from the mouths that matter. We at Fashion Vanguards believe it is time to stop talking and make change. The labeling of mental disorders or mental illnesses carries social stigma and negative connotations which prevent us from tackling the issue. In this series, we address the growing concerns of more and more people who are suffering or have recovered from mental ill health within the fashion industry and the creative sector as a whole. Thanks for tuning in. This episode, hosted by the lovely Tamara, serves up a more intimate and candid perspective on the topic. Stay tuned for more edifying discussion and to learn from her eclectic mix of panel speakers. Joining the panel, we have myself, your host, Tamira. I'm a digital content assistant for Primark, a theatre reviewer and a youth mentor. Mira, the founder of Hidden Voices and a journalist for PrivSec. I am Sinead and I am the anti-coach. I'm Kim Noble. I'm an artist, mother, author, and I happen to have DID. And I'm Bobby, Bulgarian designer, dressmaker, and I'm a founder of Common Ground. Welcome to episode two of the Fashion Vanguard's Mental Health series. Continuing our discussions on the topic and with reports of it on the rise, this episode will look at how much we know and understand about mental ill health, as well as identifying society's most at-risk groups. Okay, so let's test our knowledge. Can anyone name the most common types of mental disorders or illnesses along with their associated characteristics? So you've got um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. So having things in the right place, having to press a button or do something a particular number of times or in a particular order. That's my understanding of OCD. Okay. Dissociative identity disorder. Um, The old name was multiple personality disorder which is caused through trauma and the personality at a very young age splits into several different personalities. And then you've obviously got (laughs) ones like depression. That stereotype when you, if someone's Mm. depressed, it's very obvious. You're not going to see them. They'll become quite withdrawn. Um, But is that the reality? But yeah, yeah, the the assumption is that it's very obvious you're sad. Mm. I've encountered a lot of people that have suffered from depression and they're not, don't seem to be sad. It's the symptoms are really hard to find. I think they're different from people to people. Some people may be so happy and jolly, but when they go home, the house is a state because they're not taking care of themselves because that's a sign of depression. We've got bipolar disorder. Oh, yeah. Because that's another one some people may know about. Um, I guess substance abuse is in that part of mental disorders. So, you know, like mm-hmm. drugs or alcohol. And then there's other ones that we mentioned, anorexia, acute stress disorder, bulimia, bipolar, body dysmorphia, which I've started to hear more about through social media, actually. I feel like a lot of people in the um, body positivity movement are kind of talking more about body dysmorphia. I think there was something that came recently about how there's a new term they use now Mm -hmm. to talk about like filters and how it's caused some sort of morphia or something. I can't remember what the word is, but they were saying how like Snapchat and filters now have made people like, it's like like body dysmorphia, but Mm -hmm. there's another word I'm going to can't remember. (laughs) Um, Brief psychotic disorder. Conversion disorder, which is um, voluntary motor or sensory functions, which are not intentionally produced, but cannot be better explained by another health condition. Delusional disorder is one. Paedophilia, kleptomania. I didn't realise that a paedophilia was actually a mental illness. I don't actually, I it's actually quasi- classified this mental actually, illness. Actually, um, paedophilia there's actually that's actually the wrong term Mm -hmm. is the paedophilia is for you have to be no it is a dementia disorder you have to be diagnosed of being a Mm paedophile if you've been having those feelings for about six months or more or something like that Mm -hmm. and then you have um in i think in there's a couple of other words for people for pre if you're attracted to prepubescent kids and then kids after the hit pbtt there's like a whole name Mm -hmm. but they i remember reading it something I did a whole unit on it and I'm pretty sure it's in the same So it's treatable if it's a mental health? Uh, I'm not sure about that. But I mean, there are still options out there, but... 
Yeah, I've never heard about no. treatment regarding but I, well, it. I didn't realise it was mental health, and usually no, definitely. there's some treatment, usually when you've got a mental health problem. Mm, if it can't be point. treated, is it actually yeah, a mental it, health? I remember mm, it being you have question. to be six months or longer for you to yeah, start to getting those feelings. Um, schizophrenia, we've mentioned there's sexual arousal disorder, shared psych- psychotic, um, substance abuse, voyeurism, erectile disorder... Um, exhibitionism, um, wow. panic disorders. So obviously a lot of people may know about panic attacks and anxiety attacks where some people struggle to breathe is what I've kind of, not me personally experiencing it, but helping other friends through it is the thought that they can't breathe, but there's probably a lot more to it. And then there's other ones that we mentioned, anorexia, acute stress disorder, bulimia, bipolar, body dysmorphia, which I've started to hear more about yeah, through social I've, media, actually. Yeah. I feel like yeah. a lot of people... And the um, body positivity movement are kind of talking more about at the moment. A lot of school children seem to really be experiencing anxiety, and it could be for multiple reasons. It could be the rise of social media, or maybe it's pressure from exams and teachers. So, any opinions? On you know, that? with the anxiety one. Yeah. This year was probably the first year that I've really encountered because mm. I'm not. I don't have anxiety. Yeah. But I've encountered a lot of people that do have it. And you brought the school thing, and it's because my cousin is suffering from so much anxiety from GCSEs. I've met a lot of other kids getting anxiety from A levels, and it's quite shocking actually. There's so much pressure, and it's got to the point. Actually, when I think about it, when I was in high school, I went to an all-girls school, it was a grammar school, and there was just so much pressure to study, get high grades. And now I'm thinking about it, majority of the girls did have a lot of anxiety. Mm. I've actually witnessed a lot of girls having anxiety attacks, but it was just, oh, she's just panicking, oh, she's just like, oh, it's just like a little asthma attack. But when I'm thinking about it, it's much deeper. And when my cousin has anxiety attacks, she knows to call me. And I know the first thing is, is not to tell her just to relax. The first thing is, I I just talk to her about something going on in my life to distract her. Mm. Um, One time my friend called me at 3am in the morning and she had the severe, like the most worst anxiety attack. She was like, I didn't mean to wake you up, you know. And all I could think was, well, who cares about you like waking me up? I'm going to tell you about Game of Thrones because (laughs) that's what I did. And for about two hours she was just there until she fell asleep. And like, I felt really happy that she could fall asleep. But I think anxiety, especially, is something that needs to be talked about more because there's stress on social media, stress of education, money. So, yeah, money when you're a student at university and just general life. You life. Know? <laughs> general life. Like with my anxiety attacks, I used to be sick. Yeah. So I remember driving on the way to an exam and I had to pull over and I like threw up. And then um, the last one I got where I was sick was when I was at university. I used to call them my soggy biscuit moments. It used to be like the word I would use and then my friends would be like, right, okay, she's she's not feeling that great today. Um, So yeah, it is quite hard to deal with, especially because you just feel like you feel just not very, you want to feel strong. No one wants to feel weak and you see everyone else, Matt, you, well, you see, you think everyone else is managing fine, but that's how you see it. And then internally, it's just like, oh my gosh, again, like I, I'm struggling to travel here or there. Like I couldn't even travel up the road alone without stopping on wow. the train and like throwing up. But I've travelled alone now. I went away for a month. So I was like, younger me never would have thought I would have been able to do that kind of thing. So it's definitely improved. That's progress. But it is, yeah, and it is something that they should talk about more in schools and also teachers should offer support. So yep. places that you can go if you are having a moment like that, because being in the classroom probably isn't going to help <laughs> when you're feeling like that. Um, and yeah, it just it's something some people have to deal with for their whole life and they have to start managing. It is good to have a conversation about mm. it, because if you think about it, the, the very foundation of anxiety is fear. Mm. And whenever I had anxiety moments, I always asked myself, what is the worst thing that can happen? So it, it suddenly calmed me down. It brought me to the reality of it is well, it's going to be okay, it's not that bad. Yeah. But when you don't know exactly what you're dealing with, it's hard because I believe that exposure, it's already half the solution of the problem. Mm. So if you know that you're dealing with anxiety and this anxiety, it's the root of the anxiety is fear. I'm not saying that it's you can do it yourself, but at least there is some acknowledgement and you can develop systems and you can develop mm. patterns that you can use to help yourself when there is nobody to talk to. It's um, It can be very vicious. I'd say I've, I've come across it, um, so in my day job, I do apprenticeship training. So I work with young adults that have left school with kind of no qualifications. And you actually spend more time learning about them and these, you know, things that have cropped up and those 
anxious feelings of I'm not good enough. Why am I doing this learning? How, how am I going to help? And part of um, the framework that we help to deliver is we actually signpost them. You know, go and have a chat to someone. I'm not the expert. I can listen. Mm. But actually, do you know what? Head to these guys. These are the professionals and they can help you. And giving them that that number, that website, whatever it is, is a massive step for them. And no one's ever said that. They've just said, oh, I'm being silly. And we're coming from the outside of it as someone who hasn't suffered with a mental illness. We, very broad generalisation, but are very dismissive. Oh, you're fine. Don't be silly. It's just a nervous feeling. Oh, you'll be fine tomorrow. Cheer up. Chin up. Doesn't doesn't do much, does it, for that person that just needs to go and talk to someone or just have someone to listen. But the reality of the matter is there are people that don't actually know that they live with anxiety. Yeah. Like myself. I did not realize that I spent the majority of my life living with anxiety. As I'm coming also from a culture and a country where mental health, it's not seriously taken. To actually go to have counseling, that means that this, there is something seriously wrong with you. So when I came here and I've noticed that I do not react the normal way. I should not be afraid in crowded places. I should not feel nervous around people that are standing too close to me. Like the basic things. You think to yourself, I'm actually living in fear. So this is when I reached out for help. And I believe that there are many people that don't even know that they live with anxiety. It's so normal. I think it's really interesting as someone who hasn't suffered from anxiety attacks or anything. So I'm from the outside and to hear it from you specifically how you feel how it makes you feel I think more education needs to be done on people that don't know much about mental health because you said people are quite dismissive about it and so it makes people think oh you know it's nothing you know why are they getting scared over nothing but the reality is it's caused you a big issue in your life you know you didn't even realize it and it's something that definitely needs to be talked about more educated more Just a quick reminder, you're listening to the Fashion Vanguards podcast hosted by Alpha Mega London. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on and give us a review. And if you would like to get in touch, please drop us a message at info at alphamegalondon.com. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. So we kind of touched upon um, how the youth... Uh, demographic who really suffer from mental illness but who do we think other at-risk groups could be i think men yeah i think men i'm not saying they're probably the most at risk but mm -hmm. i think they are a big risk uh, group uh, mainly because it's not talked about it's a lot of stigma it's not normalized and for me i think it's men they don't talk about their feet well not, not all of them don't talk about their feelings and stuff but um they don't there's not a lot of help out there for men compared to help for women and kids. Um, I think that's just the truth. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree because I personally feel that we have neglected them emotionally in, in some kind of way because we as women, we, we are emotional when we are acknowledged as people that should have emotions and it's much easier for us to be the weak one and express yourself but we somehow disregarded that men go through the same thing and actually on them the pressure is even greater right now and yes the other the other group at risk for me is young generations not only the one that are in school primary school young adults i work with a lot of them and even if you uh, look at the lifestyle they're living and and the generation that gr they're growing the society there is so much comparison they have to hold a certain standard 24 7. when i was growing up as soon as i come back home every problem is gone because i didn't have the social media i didn't have mm -hmm. the phone nobody was bullying me i didn't have to keep standards that are placed and you can't meet them because they're just marketing mm -hmm. so it's a lot of pressure on them and then there is a lot of misunderstanding what i say is they cannot connect to the generation that is raising them the same way that they will connect to someone that is close to them because we fail to understand them many times i'm saying that because i have an 18 years old son and when he was 15 um, i realized that he is very unhappy 
and it made me very sad because I don't think a child at this young age should be feeling waking up depressed, waking up miserable because of the way they're living. They don't have privacy. They have no right to be wrong. They have no right to to do something in a way that it's not up to the social standard. It's it's very hard. It's very hard. They literally have to prove themselves 24-7. So you think it's social media has a large kind of impact on that? that oh, absolutely. Person. Yeah. But it's also there is disconnection between us as generation that is mm-hmm. raising them because it's only for the fact that we're living in London, only that much you can spend to give quality time to your children. I believe that the way to raise a confident young person is to spend quality time with them, not on your phone, actually spend quality time with them and build relationship because Mm -hmm. this is what gives them confidence. If you think about it, the first model and the first figure that they will always want to impress or to make, how to say, proud in their lives, this is the parents and this is where it all starts. It's really interesting you say that actually because um, I went to go and watch Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Our Town? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not football to our time. Right. And um, it's basically about, it's it starts and it's just life and you're kind of thinking, why am I watching life when I live it? And it's not till the end of the play that you kind of realise um, after one of the characters has passed away that they realise each moment is special and she says we kind of live life blindly and um, how we don't even look people in the face that much, that there are simple things, simple moments. And it's amazing how a play that was written X amount of years ago is still relevant, if not more relevant today. And it is, it's just interesting just how these connections with people, just how a gesture, a conversation, a look in the face, a hug, a nod of understanding actually has such a large impact on someone and almost validation for their feelings. So yeah, I understand what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Communication and connection is a key, mm-hmm. not through the phone. <laughs> Absolutely. There's um, there's a workshop that I've done up in the Midlands. It's called Radical Child Care. So it's looking at changing that narrative about how children are growing up now with, with all of the pressures of the modern world. And she does an exercise and she gets you to close your eyes and think of the thir- first thing you remember as a child. And our age group all remember playing, hiding somewhere, playing with a grown-up. Mm-hmm. And they're starting to see now, as they're doing this with younger children, that that's not their stock answer and it should be their stock answer. So, you know, if you're talking about, you know, four or five-year-olds and they're not thinking about playing, their mental health is already impacted before they even know what mental health is. And that kind of terrifies me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's every dear thing, if you think about it, your favourite dish, like I observed, especially in in my family or people close to me. It's always something to do with your childhood. It's not the greatest. My son's favorite dish, it's not something I cook. <laughs> <laughs> it's my sister's. <laughs> but he's still very close to his childhood because he grew up away for, for a while. But yes, they, they, there is a disconnection and it's really damaging. I think another risk group is, um, how do I say it? People that aren't, they're not from the UK, they're not westernised, they're in traditional countries. For example, I'm Sri Lankan Tamil, and I think within the Tamil community, there's a lot of um, people don't talk about mental health. It's just not... Th- if if you go to Jaffna, you know, we've just come from a really horrible genocide, and people are suffering from mental health now. You know, you can see it on the streets, you can see people suffering, they're living simple lifestyles, but it's not talked about, it's dismissed. You've got depression, go over it. And it's that. And I think it's not just people in Sri Lanka. and It's people in other countries that have been affected by war and pretty much any other country that isn't as westernised and progressive. And it's, it's where if you are seen as having a mental health, you are you are like the black sheep. You shouldn't be in society. You shouldn't be... Or you're, not, you're not perfect to get married or you're not clever. And I think those are the people that are, mo- are at most risk because they don't get the help. There aren't support groups out there. And um, obviously that's not going to change until those countries start realising that actually mental health is very important to everything in your life. But that's, I think, a massive risk group. Yeah, definitely. It's almost as if there's an impression that if you're depressed, you're lazy um, in certain cultures and stuff because obviously you're you're tired, you can't... It's hard to get out of bed, so... Um, I saw on Twitter, I think, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, about how a girl had taken a picture of her friend's room and it was absolutely tip, like, Mm. you couldn't even see the floor. 
and they were like, my girl must have tweeted about it, oh, like, that's so disgusting. And then everyone was like, that's not disgusting. You should, I think you should check up on your friend because that's not not necessarily normal. It's something that you should maybe check up on because that's sort of a sign of depression. Turns out I think she was depressed. Yeah. Um, and then I saw another tweet about, I oh, had one girl had taken a picture of her room and it was like a, a tip, clothes everywhere, food, spoil, everything. Then she posted a picture of her about two months ago, uh, uh, two months later, and her room was spotless. And she was like, guys, like, I know this is a big step for me, but I've cleaned my room and I feel like I'm getting somewhere. And I think, you know, everyone was just like, this is amazing. Like, mm-hmm. it's a one step. But then you always get the haters that are like, you know. Not always. But, you know, um, mental illness, it shows in different ways to different people. Mm-hmm. But I think with the younger generation, it's made public a lot more, like with yeah. social mm-hmm. media. Like, in my days, you know, I, there's no social media and um, I went into hospital at 14 uh, to have treatment and it was a lot different than it is today mm. it was a lot easier to get the treatment but you also wasn't so aware of the stigma you know you, you're just um, because of social media you get the hate people you know people you say something about depression you get people you know saying oh, you're lazy or whatever but you know it wasn't there um, when I was younger I do think a lot of the problems have come from uh, social media. It swings and roundabouts, I think, with social media. It's got its good uses. But I think if you're suffering from depression and somebody publicly writes that you're lazy, it just, you know, knocks you down. Um, Yeah, there's definitely pros and cons of it, like you were saying, because I guess for some people it helps to create a safe space for certain communities. So there's a lot like of different platforms for people who um, who perhaps struggle from different mental health illnesses um, and also people like of colour who need a safe mm. space to talk about certain issues. But then how safe is it when people can come and jump in and put stuff in the comments, yeah. then screenshot their picture, put it on another platform and then they That's start right. speaking trash about it? And so it's like, how how safe can it really be? What are the what and are that, I think that adds to people's insecurities because they post something feeling, you know, it's a bad day today. They announce it and then they get attacked and it's like mm. it's too late. You know, you've done, you've said it. You can't take it down. Well, you can take it down, but people know or people share it. So yeah. I just think it's. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I use uh, social media, but mm. and I've had people say some terrible things. Um, and it can be hard. Um, I decide not to read them. Um, but sometimes it is really, really difficult. Mm. You know, they go, go kill yourself, you know, and it's, um, you know, you think, you think, one, how there's so many nasty people out there. And on, on the other hand, I think, you know, I'm quite a strong person and somebody suffering from depression, you know, it, it could be de- destroying for them. I, I think, think in this sorry realize. I just don't think people realize I don't mm. think they do I think because it's so easy to hide behind that keyboard that phone that whatever mm. and that common courtesy manners just have disappeared so for all the good about talking about mental health and raising awareness yeah. about different conditions and and what that can look like in different people somebody like you've just said just goes online and goes oh well you just you know go and do whatever it is you want to do then mm. and why does anybody think that that's okay to say? Yeah. Would you say it to your best friend's face? They wouldn't say it to anybody to their no, face. That is, it's behind the keyboard. But also, they've got their own issues and they've got problems. Absolutely. And, you know, so, but it, because it's all public, I think, um, especially for vulnerable people, it can be, you know, um, hard at times. Yeah. Yeah, that was about to say, like, do you really hide behind the keyboard when you express such an emotion, such an anger, such, such, it's obviously you have a deep emotional problem yourself. Mm. Happy people don't go up and down hurting people. No. But the other thing that just came to mind to do with the younger generation and social media, I don't understand the practice of creating account to a child that that is underage why are they allowed to have this access like for example my son is 18 Mm -hmm. and i did not allow him to have social media Uh, or if he was to have social media even though he was a boy i had to control everything that is going on there we have young girls at the age of 10 12 13 15 out there exposed to things that we have no idea and they have access to Snapchats, Instagram, Facebook. Snapchat, you can't even trace them. So 
this is what I mean. Like, it's not only about them, but we have to educate parents as well. There is a great responsibility. You can't just expose your child to those things and then expect your child to be emotionally healthy. Mm. How can you control 24-7 what is going through their phones? They sleep, they, they go to bed at 3 a.m. This is their lives. This is this is their whole Yeah. I don't I don't understand why are under age because Facebook requires a certain age, Instagram requires an age. You have to be age appropriate to use those social platforms, yet there is no control. Yeah. I can imagine a lot of parents maybe don't even realise that their child might be being cyber bullied. Um, because they're too ashamed or they're too sad. You know, you can just delete the comments, delete the conversation. So it's hard to try and regulate what they're experiencing. It might, in my to. country, is a practice for the mother to create an account for the child so they can tag them. So they can take a selfie together and tag them. Mm. Yeah, I've seen a few of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with cyberbullying, people just don't understand the concept that now everything kids do is online. And that's mm. just that's just something that is just going to be like that from yeah, now on. True. You know, I'm seeing my six year old cousin know how to do stuff on the iPad and Mac, and I'm thinking, oh my god, like, <laughs> and so you know, they're going to have most of their lives on cyber. They're going to get bullied if they don't have a phone, or they're not going to get bullied. They're mm. going to get bullied if they don't have certain apps or games, and you know, now. It's they, get, they get a phone, they get a message, oh, you're blah, 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 okay, you block it. They just make a new account. Yeah. And that's just the reality. And pe- I know Facebook has, you have to be 16 or 50, something like that, and Instagram too. People just make up lies, because I think when I made Facebook, I made up my age. Like, <laughs> But um, when I was 16, my mum and dad used to take my phone away. Yeah. And um, I used to hate it. I was like, you know, why would you take my phone away? But now seeing it as a 23-year-old, I'm thinking thank god they took my phone away because i was so like engrossed with social media at that time that's when instagram was growing and stuff and i was just never never focused on myself mm. and it's sad to see that kids are so engulfed in it but that's just the reality is now but that even all the filters what is it doing it's creating a distorted self-image mm. it's already f- um f- uh, how to say fueling an emotional problem. You do not accept yourself the way you are. Yeah. Yeah. And going off that, it's affected me, and I can openly, ha- openly put my hand up to it, to the point that social media has made me feel absolutely horrible when I've been at the lowest point in my life where I used to have severe, severe eczema. I used to not show my body. I used to show my skin. If you met me a year ago, I would just not even have come. I wouldn't even come here. I was so ashamed. And when I was looking through social media, I think, oh, God, like, it was pissing me off. It was making me so sad. I used to cry about it every day. So I guess at that point, I was really depressed for about a good couple of months. I never went to the doctors about it, about my mental health, because I was just thinking, it's just eczema. It's just eczema. Why is it affecting me so much? And, um... One day I took the time out of my day to write something just for myself, just let it out. And like, I was just thinking about it. I was like, oh my God. Now I'm skin out because I just learned to get off social media for a bit. Mm. And I was getting more stressed. It was affecting my skin more. And, you know, it's quite... People think it's just filters, it's just pictures of other people, but it really does impact you. Because if you had met me a year ago, you would not think I'm the same person I am today. Mm. And it's so scary that I was at a point like that, but it's just not like me. Everyone else is like that. Absolutely. My, um, I got a new phone not that long ago. Turn the, turn the camera on. Oh, this is fancy. And the beauty setting was already at max. I was like, I don't look like this. I'd love to look like this. Don't get me wrong. No wrinkles, no moles, no nothing. But I was like, they preset that. That's... I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It yeah. just so confused me. Yeah, That's quite interesting, though. But I think it is good that we've kind of looked at how um, the youth are affected and what is influencing that. And I like what you kind of brought in about what you experienced when you were younger to where we are now. In conclusion, we've established that the mental illnesses and disorders we are most commonly aware of are anxiety and depression. Despite this, there are a large number of classified disorders and illnesses that we're either unaware of or to a greater or lesser extent have a negative view of. 
Using our own lives as an example, we've either personally experienced mental illness or come to understand it through our friends and family. We discuss that the most at-risk groups are overwhelmingly young children and adults, calling into question the negative effect of their environments such as social media. Please follow us at Alpha Omega London on Instagram, Facebook and Pinterest, where we'll be sharing superb artworks from a hand selection of artists within our network whose pieces depict their feelings on mental health. There you can see works from the incredibly talented Bobby Ray, Brendan Totten, Roa al Mansuri, Stephanie Mikado, Patrick Gerard and Clara Catley. Thank you for tuning in and a huge thanks to all our wonderful panellists. Please remember to rate five stars and subscribe.